In Chapter 3, we learned how to create, apply, and edit cascading style sheets. And we learned that using CSS is the best and most powerful way to ensure that all elements in our website are formatted consistently. Now in this chapter, we're going to back up the site files and import a redesigned striped umbrella website. Each page has been redesigned using CSS for the page layout to provide that consistency, and you will use this new site for the rest of the book. You will then create and apply embedded styles and work with external style sheets to format the pages in the site. So what I've done is downloaded those resources from the internet, the Chapter 8 files, and put them on my desktop. I'm now going to go into Dreamweaver, and since all of these files are outdated and I want to bring in this new site from Chapter 8, I'm going to go up to my site settings, establish a new site. I'm going to call this Striped Umbrella. And then I'm going to browse for a file and go out to my desktop and choose the Striped Umbrella folder. When I open and select this and then click Save, you'll see that Dreamweaver will recache my files. You'll see that I already have a CSS or an external style sheet dictating the style of my website. I have an ICO. I have the HTML files, I have the HTML5 to column fixed header CSS controlling the formatting of that CSS layout, and some subordinate pages, as well as the sprite assets for my navigation bar, and then the assets for the images and videos on this site. So when we're using the style sheets for design and to make embedded styles, which are internal styles whose code is located within the head section of the HTML code, the benefit here is that we're going to be able to format the website content globally. So if both an external style and an embedded style are applied to a single element, the embedded style is always going to override that external style. This is because the styles are in a hierarchical nature. And so the inline style will always override embedded, which will always override external. So since you, mm, yeah, since you, to create the class style, I'm going to open up my index.html page for the striped umbrella. Then I'm going to click on my new CSS rule. I want to click on this drop down selector here because I want to create a class rule. So I'm going to select class from above, and now I need to give it a name. In this case, I'm going to just call it contact info. You'll notice that I don't do any spaces or uppercase letters because it's also one of those best practices. And you can also see that su underscore styles.css is already located as my external style sheet here. So I don't want this going to my external style sheet because I want it to override anything that may be in that external style sheet that would conflict with this. So I'm going to click on that drop down menu and I'm going to select this document only. That's going to make it an embedded CSS. Now I'm going to click OK. That will open up my CSS definition and I just want to make a couple of different changes to my type. For instance, let's change this to Arial. We're going to do the font size small. Font size or font style italic. And let's change our color to 003. Go ahead and click OK. And now the contact.info is going to show in our style, showing that it's embedded. You'll also see that it's up here in style type on line 10 of my code. So now I want to apply this style. So I'm going to select the paragraph with my striped umbrella contact information. Now that I have that done, I'm going to click the italic button because this is currently an EM tag in the actual code itself, which means that it's an inline style. Because I have that inline style there, it will override anything that I have in my head style and anything that I have in my external style sheet. So for the style that I just created to apply, I'm going to have to take that inline style off. 
you can see that once I click the italic, the EM disappears from my code and the striped umbrella contact information goes back to normal. Now I can grab that contact info by going down to CSS in my property inspector, targeted rule, click that drop down arrow there, and then we're going to just grab contact info and that will be applied to our text. Now we're going to want to make sure that we save our work. Editing your styles can be pretty easy. Either way, we have two ways of doing it through the CSS style panel. The first way of doing it is by clicking on this little pencil icon after selecting the style that we want to edit. That will open back up our CSS Rule Definition dialog box in which we can go through and change anything that we want here. Now another way that we can do this, which is quick and easy, is by the properties info down here. So if I wanted to add a property or change a property, let's change our color here, I can go into that and just quickly hit it in my properties and it will automatically apply once I change the attribute over here. So to recap, an external style is something that is in an external.css file. Embedded is a style whose code is in the head section of the page. And the inline is an individual page code written in the body section rather than the head section. To create an embedded style, you will use the new CSS rule button in the CSS styles panel to open the new CSS rule dialog box. From there, you're going to choose what kind of CSS rule you want. Then you're going to contain the combination of formatting attributes that you want to apply to the blocks of text or other page elements. After you name the rule and click OK, the rule definition dialog box will open with the settings for the type category displayed. Once you create a class style, it will appear in your CSS style panel and the class list in the HTML property inspector. The targeted rule list in the CSS property inspector will also show it. To edit a rule, you're going to click the rule you want to edit in the panel, then click the Edit Rule button in the CSS Styles panel, and then use the Rule Definition dialog box to change the settings. When you use the property inspector to format a web page element, a predefined HTML tag will be added to that element, and you might want to change the definition of the HTML tag. You can click on the tag you want to redefine and then click OK to open the CSS rule definition box where you specify the desired formatting. Once you save the rule and apply it, the tags you target will be formatted according to the altered settings. And there are two modes in the CSS style panel, all mode or current mode. All mode will show all style sheet rules that appear in the top half of the panel, which is called the all rules pane, as well as any kind of embedded or inline styles. Whereas if you are just on the current mode, it will only show you the styles that apply to the page that you're currently on. When you click one of the rules, the bottom half, which is called the property pane, will list any other properties. Then when the current mode is selected, the top half of the panel will be the summary selection and the object with the style is selected, you can open the web page and then the summary for selection pane will display the properties. Here's where you can switch between current and all, the summary for the selection, the property pane, and the rules pane. The small pane between the summary and selection pane is the, called the rules pane and this displays the location of the current selected rule in the open document. CSS3 is the latest version of CSS being developed by the W3C. It was introduced to improve coding techniques such as new tags to insert audio and video objects. And of the new features is a at font face property which allows developers to embed what we call web open face format fonts. 
You can use CSS3 to organize the content by creating tabs, drop-down menus, and accordions. And tabs look similar to file folders and are used for navigation above the top page of content. Accordions are buttons that open up like an accordion to display information that will drop down below the button. And media queries are files that specifically set parameters for displaying pages on separate devices such as tablets or smartphones. Media queries specify a different style sheet for each device, such as a desktop monitor, tablet, or cell phone. Here's an example of the multi-screen preview command button that you can use to change the different layouts so that you can show your media queries. Adaptive websites are websites that adjust or modify the page content to fit the user's need and device type. To make sure that your code's compliant with today's standards, you need to validate it, and the W3C provides a free validation service that web designers and developers can use to check these style sheets. Adobe Browser Lab also gives you an online service that you can access through Dreamweaver to test your site with multiple browsers without needing to have the browser programs installed on your computer. And lastly, if you find conflicting styles, you can make sure that the author, who is the creator of the page, the user, who is the person viewing the page, or the user agent, the software through which the page is delivered, are all ranked in order of precedence. The first order of precedence is to find the declarations and specify and match the media type being used, such as the computer screen. The second order of precedence is the user, then the author, then normal, then user normal, and user agent. The third order of precedence is by the specificity of the selector, and more specific rules are applied when they get equal importance and origin with more general rules. The fourth and final order of precedence is by the order specified in the code. Imported or external style sheets are considered to be before any kind of internal styles. Pseudo class styles refer to styles that determine the appearance of a page element when certain conditions result from information external to the source. There are several tools available to assist you in defining, modifying, and checking CSS rules, such as the browser compatibility check feature. Inspect mode helps you to identify HTML elements and their associated styles, and disable slash enable CSS will allow you to disable a rule, property, and design view so that you can compare the effects of the affected page with the element with and without that property. Next, we're going to get into collecting data with forms. Many websites have pages designed to collect information from users. You've likely seen such pages when ordering books online from Amazon.com or when purchasing airline tickets from an airline website. Adding a form to a web page provides interactivity between your users and your business. To collect information from your users, you add forms for them to fill out and send to a web server to be processed. Forms on a web page are no different from forms that you see in everyday life. Your bank check is a simple form that asks for information, the date, the amount of the check, the name of the check's recipient, and your signature. A form on a web page consists of form objects, such as text boxes or radio buttons, into which users type information or from which they make selections. Form labels identify the form object by its function, such as first name, which is a label besides a text box that will collect the user's first name. In this chapter, we're going to add a form to a page that provides a way for in interested users to ask for more information about the Striped Umbrella Resort. This form will also give them the opportunity to comment on a website and make helpful suggestions. Feedback is a vital part of a website and must be easy for a user to submit. Forms are just one of the many different tools that web developers use to collect information from users. A simple form can consist of one form object and a button that submits information to a web server such as a search text box that you fill out and a button that you click to start the search. More complex forms can collect contact information or allow students to take exams online and receive grades instantly. You can use forms to insert information into databases or to find a specific record in a database. The range of uses for forms is limited only by your imagination. All forms need to be connected to an application server that will process the information that the form collects. 
The application can store the form data in a database or simply send it to you in an email message, but you need to specify how you want the information used, stored, and processed. Before you use Dreamweaver to create a form, it's a good idea to write down the information you want to collect and the order to which you want to collect it. It's also a good idea to make a sketch of the form for your wireframe. Planning your form content at the beginning will save you from spending time organizing the information when you create the form in Dreamweaver. The Striped Umbrella website will contain a form for users to request more information, sign up for an electronic newsletter, and submit their comments about the website. When planning your form content, you should organize the information in a logical order that will make sense to the users. For instance, users expect to fill in their name before their address because almost all forms request that your name comes before the address, so you should follow the same standard. Placing information in a different order is just going to confuse your users. People on the internet are notoriously hurried and often provide only information that's required or that is located on the top half of the form. Therefore, it's a good idea to put most of the information at the top of your form. In fact, this is a good rule to follow for web pages in general. The more important information should be above the fold and the part of the page is visible before you have to scroll to see the rest. As with all pages, your form should have a good contrast between the color of the text and the color of the form background. Once you finish planning your form content, you're ready to create the form in Dreamweaver. To create a form object on a web page, you're going to use the Form button in the Form category on the Insert panel. Clicking the Form button will insert a dashed red outline around your form area. But by itself, a form object can do nothing. To make your form usable, you need to configure it so that it talks to the email server and processes the information that the users enter. The form must have a script program running behind it to process the information users enter so that you can gather and use it. Designers use two methods to process information collected in a form, server-side scripting and client-side scripting. Server-side scripting uses applications that reside on your web server and interact with the form information collected. For example, when you order clothing from a retail web website, the host server will store and process the item, size, color, price, shipping information, and credit card information. The most common types of server-side applications are what we call Common Gateway Interface, or CGI scripts, Cold Fusion programs, Java Server Web Page, or JSP, and Active Server Pages, or ASP applications. Client-side scripting means that the user's computer will process the form. The script resides on the web page rather than on the server. For example, a mortgage calculator that allows you to enter prices and interest rates to estimate mortgage payments processes the data on the user's computer. The most common types of scripts stored on a web page are created with a scripting language called JavaScript or JScript. Server-side applications and scripts collect the information from the form, process the information, and then perform some sort of action depending on the information that the form contains. You can use the Property Inspector to specify the application that you want to process the form and the information you want it to send to the processing application. So the Action property in the Property ins Inspector will specify this script that you're going to use to process the form data. And most of the time it's going to be a CGI script, something such as CGI-bin forward slash or myscript.cgi. If you're using a Cold Fusion page such as mypage.cfm or an active server page such as mypage.asp, you will change the properties of your selected form. This is done with the method property, and this specifies the hypertext transfer protocol or the HTTP used to get the form data to the web server. The get method specifies the ASCII data collected in the form will be sent to the server and appended to the URL or the file included in the action property. For instance, if the action property is set to forward slash CGI bin myscript.cgi, then the data will be sent as a string of characters after the address as follows. CGI bin forward slash slash. So the method property is going to specify that HTTP and the get method will specify that the ASCII data collected in the form will be sent to a server appended to the URL or the file included in the action property. 
The POST method specifies that the form data should be sent to the processing script as a binary or encrypted file, allowing you to send data securely. When you specify the POST method, there's no limit to the amount of information that can be collected in the form, and the information is secure. The form name property will specify a unique name for the form, and this name can be a string of any alphanumeric characters, but it can't include spaces. The target property will let you specify the window in which you want the form data to be processed. If you put underscore blank, the target will open a form in a separate browser window. CGI is one of the most popular tools used to collect form data. CGI allows a web browser to work directly with the programs that are running on the server and also makes it possible for a website to change in response to user input. These programs can be written in computer languages such as Perl or C. But when CGI script collects data from the form, it passes the data to a program running on a web server, which in turn then passes the data back to the user's web browser. That makes changes to the website in response to the form data, and then the resulting data is stored in a database or sent to an email server, which will send the information in the email message to the designated recipient. So let's go to Dreamweaver and see how to insert a form. So I'm opening my Striped Umbrella website and opening the file dw9 underscore one from the drive and folder where you store your data files. I'm going to save this as feedback.html. So I'm going to go file, save as, and then type feedback in my document here. Click save. And now I'm ready to turn this into a form. So what I want to do is click inside my content container here. You can see that I'm in the content area. I can also see that I'm in the content area by looking down here and seeing I'm in the div container article.content. Now I want to insert my form element. So I'm going to change from the common category to the form category on my insert panel, and I'm going to click my form button. This inserts that red dash line that shows that I now have a feedback form on my insertion point. The content container top border is going to be under the menu bar, and in the design view, we want to select the forms category, insert panel, and then click the form button to insert a new form. But you can also go to insert on the top panel and then down to form and get your form elements here. Then we can click the form tag in the tag selector. So I'm going to be in my content area here and click on the form tag to make sure that I have my entire form tag specified. Now I'm going to type feedback in my form ID. I just want this form to be called feedback. The method is automatically defaulted to post, and so I'm all ready to just go ahead and save my work at this time. Next, what we want to do is format our form. To add a table to my form, I'm going to click to place the insertion point inside the form outline. I want to make sure that that cursor is flashing in between these red dashed lines so that it's encapsulated in that form tag. Now in the table dialog box, I'm going to go to common on my insert panel and go down to table, and that's going to open up my table settings. Here I'm going to make the rows 10, columns 2. I'm going to take out anything formatting there that I had in there before that I don't want applied to this table, and I'm going to make the top as my header row. I'm going to click OK, and my table is inserted. Now I want to merge these first two call or spaces together, so I'm going to click to highlight both of those, and then click my Merge Selected Cells down here in my Property Inspector. That has now made my top header row one cell, and it expands both those columns. I'm then going to click in there to type, to request further information, please complete this form. Now because I designated a header for this table, this top row text is automatically centered and bold, and screen readers will use this header to assist users who have visual impairments to identify this table. Next, I'm going to click down a few rows, and I want to put my information as I'm interested in information about I would like to receive your newsletters, and I learned about you from, in the fifth row, sixth row, and seventh row. So this table is 
holding our form objects. And remember that there are several ways to apply styles in a table. You can apply styles by selecting the text, clicking inside a paragraph, selecting a cell, and applying a style to it, or applying a style to the HTML tag, such as a table tag. Next, I want to add form labels using my label button. First, I want to verify that my insertion point is in the cell below the one that contains the text I've learned about you from. So I want to make sure that it's flashing right below that. Next, I'm going to go back up to my insert panel. I'm going to change it back to the forms category. And here, I'm going to click my label button. Now to view the changes to code, you can see that it's down here and I now have these label tags inserted on line 79 of my code. You may need to scroll down in the design pane to see this cell, but what we're going to do is in this row here, we're going to type comments. Now when we refresh our button, you're going to be able to see that comments is in between the label headers here. In between these two label tags over in my code view, I'm going to type the word comments. Then I'm going to click my refresh button over here in my CSS style panel. What I want to do next is make sure that comments is inserted in the area where I wanted it in the row below I learned about you from. And I also want to create a new rule for this form table. Now, as you recall, we have a table style already set in our SU underscore style CSS. I want to add a new rule to this CSS, and it's going to allow for us to format this specific form table. So I'm going to make this a class selector, and I'm going to call it form table. To distinguish it as something separate from my table properties. You can see that I'm adding it to SU underscore styles. Click OK. And all I want to do here is change my box category to a width of 625 pixels. Click OK. And now I want to apply this form table rule to my form table. So to do that, I'm going to select my table tag down here in my tag selector. That's going to grab my entire table. And then all I need to do is click on the drop down menu of the class here to apply my new form underscore table style. Now I am going to save my work. The table is now wider, which will allow the labels in the first column to appear on one line without wrapping more form objects when we add them. To create a new tag selector rule that will modify the TD tag in our SU underscore styles external style sheet file with the following property block vertical align top. So what I'm going to do is go to my SU underscore styles, add a new rule. This time it's going to be a tag. We're going to use the TD tag in this case and apply it to SU underscore style CSS. Click OK. Now on this one, I want to make sure that I'm going down to block on my category type, and then I'm going to make my vertical align top. Click OK. Now you can see that the text in each cell is now aligned at the top of the cell, which is going to be more apparent as we add the longer text labels and larger text fields to some of the table cells. A form provides a structure in which you can place form objects. Form objects, which are also called form elements, form controls, form inputs, or form fields, are the form components such as checkboxes, text boxes, and radio buttons that allow users to provide information and interact with your website. You can use form objects in any combination to collect the information you need. Text fields are the most common type of form object and are used for collecting a string of characters such as a name, address, password, or email address. Use the text field button on the insert panel to insert a text field. You can specify single line or multi-line text fields. 
A text area field is a field that can store several lines of text. You can use the text area field to collect comments, descriptions of problems, long answers to questions, or even a resume. Use the text area button on the insert panel to insert a text area. You can use check boxes to create a list of options from which a user can make multiple selections. For instance, you could ask for a series of check boxes listing hobbies and then ask the users to select the ones that interest them. A group of check boxes is called a checkbox group. You can use radio buttons to provide a list of options from which only one selection can be made. A group of radio buttons is called a radio group. Each radio group you create allows only one selection from within that group. You could use radio groups to ask users to select their annual salary range or their age group or maybe a t-shirt color they want to order. You could also use a radio group for users to answer yes or no questions. To insert a radio group, use the radio group button on the form category in the insert panel. You can insert a menu or a list on a form using the select list menu button on the insert panel. You use menus when you want a user to select a single option from a list of choices. You use lists when you want a user to select one or more options from a list of choices. Menus are often used to provide navigation on a website, while lists are commonly used in order for form users to choose from a list of possibilities. Menus must be open to see all of the options they contain, whereas lists display some of their options all of the time. When you create a list, you will need to specify the number of lines that will be visible on the screen by setting a value for the height property in the Property Inspector. Using hidden fields makes it possible to provide information to the web server and form processing script without the user knowing that the information is being sent. For instance, you could add a hidden field that tells the server who should receive an email message and what type of subject the message should be. You can also use hidden fields to collect information that a user does not enter and can't see on the screen. For instance, you can use a hidden field to send you the user's browser type or IP address. You can insert an image field into a form using the image field button. You can use these to create buttons that contain custom graphics. If you want your user to upload a file to your web server, you can insert a file field. This could let your users upload sample files to your website or to post photos to your website's photo gallery. All forms must include a submit button, which users will click to transfer the form data to the web server. You can also insert a reset button, which will let your users clear the data from a form and reset it back to the default values or a custom button to trigger an action that you specify on the page. You can insert a submit, reset, or custom button using the button button on the insert panel. Place the submit and reset buttons at the bottom of the form, and you can also add a security challenge. Jump menus are navigational menus that let your users go quickly to different pages in your site or to different sites on the internet. You can create jump menus quickly and easily by using the jump menu button in the forms category on the insert panel. When you insert a form object in a form, you will use the property inspector to specify a unique name for it. You can also use the property inspector to set other appropriate properties for the object, such as the number of lines or characters that you want the object to display. As you place a control on a form, you usually need to add a label. You can pay, place a form label either before or after by typing it directly on the form, and this is a good idea if you need more than a word or two for a form label. For instance, please explain the problem you are experiencing would need to be typed on the form next to the text box. If, however, you only need the words yes and no besides two radio buttons, you can add those labels using a form attribute called a label tag. You can add the label tag before or after the form object using the input tag accessibility attributes dialog box. Label tags provide good accessibility for your form objects as they clearly identify each form object and are read with screen readers. To obtain form controls designed for creating specific types of forms, such as online tests and surveys, you can visit the Adobe Marketplace in Exchange. This is a central storage location for program extensions, also known as add-ons. 
You can search the site by using keywords in a standard search text box, and you can also search for items featured by their staff and for the most recent, most popular, or most highly rated. Now let's go into Dreamweaver and see how we can work with these form objects. So on my form page in the striped umbrella, I'm going to click to place the insertion point in the first cell under the header and type first name. Now I'm going to hit my tab key. This is going to push me over in the same row here, but to the second column. That's going to allow me to use my insert panel with my forms option on to get the form text field. So I'm going to scroll up and click text field. Now this is going to open up my input tag access accessibility attributes dialog box. And for the ID, I'm going to type first name. Now, I don't want a label here because I already have my label in that first column as first name. So I'm going to cl click on the radio button for no label tag, and then I'm just going to click OK. This inserts that text box for people to type in their first name. Now I'm going to go down to the next thing in the property inspector, which allows me to determine the character width, the max characters, and some single line, multi line, or password, and also a class assigned to this. Now, in this, I want my character width to be 40, so I'm going to click in that box here in the property inspector and type 40 there. I also want it to contain up to 100 characters, so I'm going to hit my tab key to move down and type 100. You can see that once I've done that, it's and made my text box here 40 characters wide, so you still see the first 40 characters of the first name, but the max length is set at 100 characters total. I want to go through and repeat these same steps to create labels and single line text fields for last name, and then also for email, and then I will... <clears throat> Now we want to repeat those steps to do a last name field and also email. So I'm just going to type in my form field here, type last name, tab over, hit my text field button, call it last name. And again, remember that on each one of these, we need to have a unique identifier. You also don't want any label tag, and you can see that it's defaulted to that since that was my last setting. I want to make the character width 40 and the max characters 100. <clears throat> Lastly, I want to collect and lastly, I want to collect my user's email address. Now, instead of actually making a new form, you can always just select that and copy and paste it down below but that's going to take this form field and give it the same one, but then add the designator too. Dreamweaver is doing that because it knows that it has to have a unique identifier for this form to work on the web server. So I'm just going to change that to email. And now my character is 40, max character is 100, and everything else is copied from above. Next, I would like Next, I would like to insert a multiple line text field. So I'm going to click on the line to the right of comments so that I can use this field to get user comments. I'm going to this time use the text area button. I'm going to call this one comments. And I'm not going to have a label tag for this one either because I already have comments designated in this row on the first column. You can see that I get the scrolling bars in this text area field. Let's go down to our properties here and let's make the character width 50. And that will specify that 50 characters will be visible inside this text field when the page is displayed in a browser. I also want to give it a maximum of four lines. This specifies that the text box will display four lines of text. 
Now I would like to insert a checkbox group. So I'm going to put my insertion point in the empty table cell to the right of I am interested in information about. Here I'm going to click on my checkbox group. Now this is going to be defaulted to checkbox group 1. I'm going to rename this to brochures. And I want two different kinds of brochures to be available to my users. I want information on fishing and information on cruises. Now you can see that two values are automatically defaulted in Dreamweaver, so I just need to go in and change these names. The first one is the label, so that's going to be what's shown to your user, so you want to make sure that you use proper caps and spelling here. Whereas the value is actually going to be the value for our server or the information that is sent to our server to let it know that this checkbox has been checked. So I'm going to just call this one phishing. You can notice that when we put in these values and these names that we're using the all lowercase and no spaces as a standard. Next, I would like cruises. And let's just name this one cruises as well for the value. Now, using line breaks is going to make this look nice in my table, and it's going to align it to the left-hand side of the cell. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. Now you can see that I have fishing and cruises to the right-hand side of my check boxes. I also can specify that if I want these checks to have an initial state of checked or unchecked, in this case, I'm going to leave both of these unchecked because my user may not want information about either of these options. Lastly, I want to be able to put in information for my users to be able to request a newsletter. So I'm going to use a radio group to do this one. So I'm going to click at the insertion point just to the right of the newsletters. And in this case, I'm going to go down to the radio group button in my insert panel. This will open up my radio group dialog box. Let's name this newsletters. And all I want is yes or no. So this is going to limit my user to be able to click either one or the other value. And we want to tell our server what is clicked here and to distinguish the difference between these two radio buttons, I'm going to assign one as negative and one as positive. I'm going to use line breaks as well to format this. As you can see, I now have yes and no on my lines with the radio buttons. Now what we want to do is save our work and preview it in a browser. You can see that when I go and I preview it at this time, I need to save all of my files. I'll open it up in Internet Explorer. You can see that this is what it's going to look like when I first look at my page. Now because this is running client-side scripts, you're going to have to allow blocked content to get the full functionality of your form. You can see that our spry menu bar now works in this area, and you can also see that we have the text fields, the check boxes, and the radio buttons all operational. I'm going to go ahead and close out of that preview, go back to Dreamweaver. And now what I want to do is add a menu. So lastly, I want to put I learned about you from and I want a menu here. So I'm going to go over and select the list menu button from my form insert panel. For the ID here, I'm going to type in reference. I also don't want any label tag on this one. You will now notice that the Accessibility Attributes dialog box is closed, and we have reference down here in our properties. What we need to do is now put in our list values by clicking this Edit Initial List Values button here. Dreamweaver will open up the item label and value that we can now type in. And as the first list value, we want to tell the users select from list. And it's going to have a value of none. By us defining none in the value column, that's going to be sent to the processing program when a user accidentally skips this menu. 
If one of the real choices was in the top position, it might return a false positive when users really did not select it but just skipped it. This is a clue to your users that they have not made a choice yet, but it won't penalize them if they accidentally skip over this form control. Next, I want to add in item labels for From a Friend, Internet Search, Magazine Ad, and Television Ad with the appropriate values as well. Now you can see that when I want to add a new list value, I can either click on the plus button to add a new label. In this case, I'm going to do From a Friend. and just the value as friend here to correlate. Now I can also just tap, and when I do that, it will move me down into my next item label field. So I can just tap through this and quickly fill in all of my categories with the way that I want. And then magazine. And lastly, TV ad. And click OK. Now you'll notice that I have a little select from list button, which is my first value that the user sees. And then when they click on this drop down menu, they'll be able to choose from friend, internet, magazine, or TV ad. Now I want to insert a hidden field. To click to the left of the first name for your insertion point on this at the very top of your form and we're going to click on the hidden field button on our insert panel. When we do that we're going to get this little icon showing here that we have a hidden field. Now that's going to appear at the insertion point and we're going to type required down here in our property inspector as the hidden field text box. If you do not see the hidden field icon, you're going to want to go to view up here on your top menu bar and point down to visual aids. Here you have the ability to either check or uncheck to show the invisible elements. So this invisible hidden field, we're going to type in that it's required. And then we're going to make sure that we type in our values of first name, last name, and email exactly as we set them up before. This is going to add a hidden field to the form that's going to let our users know that if they neglect to complete the fields for first name, last name, or email address, that it will not be accepted. Next, we want to add our submit and reset buttons. So we're going to click in the second cell to the second of the last row, and here we are going to use our button button. So click on that, and we get an ID. In the ID, I wanted type submit and I don't want any label tag on this because the submit button is automatically going to put submit as its ID on the text box. So I can just go ahead and click OK and you can see that submit shows up on that button. Now I want to verify that that actually is selected next to the action in the property inspector. So I have the value of submit, the button name is submit, and the action is submit form. So everything is set correct here. Now I want to insert a space, so I'm just going to click to the right of my submit button, hit my space bar a couple of times, and do the button button again. This time I'm going to label it reset. And click OK. Now you'll see that it still says submit on the button even though I've named this reset. So all I need to do is click the action reset form and my value will automatically reset and it will put reset on my button. After you create a form, you should test it to make sure that it works correctly and is easy to use. We want to verify that the fields are arranged to provide a logical flow of information so that the user will not be confused about where to go next. We also want to make sure that there's enough contrast between the form text and the table background so that the text is readable. When a form contains several required fields, or fields that must be filled out before the form can be processed, it's a good idea to provide your user with visual cues. This is a different font color or another notation 
And often you see an asterisk next to the required fields with a corresponding note at the bottom or top of the form explaining that all fields marks with this asterisk are required fields. This is encouraging your user to initially complete these fields rather than attempt to submit the form and receive an error message asking them to complete the required areas. Using a different font color for the asterisks and notes is an easy way to call attention to them and make them stand out on a page. When you're finished with your form, you should always have several people test it before you publish it, and then make any necessary changes based on any testing feedback that you receive, and then test it one final time. When a web page contains content that allows the user to interact with a page by clicking or typing and then respond to this input in some way, it's said to contain dynamic content. A form is an excellent example of dynamic content because as the user fills out the form, feedback can be returned, such as the availability of window seats on a particular airplane flight, or whether or not the certain colors or sizes of clothing items are available for purchase. This exchange of information is made possible through the use of a database. Once a form is developed and a database is tied to it, you should set up a testing server to evaluate how the form works and how the data is processed. Your local computer or your remote server can serve as a testing server. You set up a testing server by filling out the relevant information in the testing server section of the site definition dialog box. You can also test your dynamic data in Design View by using the Live View button. We have covered how to control the position of text and graphic elements with precision on your web pages by using CSS Layout Box. With these, we use containers formatted with CSS to place the content on a web page. These containers can hold the images, blocks of text, flash movies, or any other page elements. You set the appearance and position of these containers using HTML tags known as div tags. With div tags, you can position elements next to each other as well as on top of each other in a stack. In this chapter, you will use another type of div called an AP div to place text and graphics on a page. AP stands for absolutely positioned, and an AP div tag creates a div with a fixed position on a web page. When you create an AP div, Dreamweaver will automatically create a rule for it. The name of this rule will begin with a pound sign or hashtag rather than a period. It is an ID type, not a class type. AP divs let you control the appearance of the elements on your web page, and AP divs allow you to stack your information in a vertical pile, allowing for just one piece of information to be visible at a time. Browsers display AP divs as an independent element, so you can easily change their contents or add or remove them without affecting the page flow. This makes them a good choice for page content that changes frequently or is based on certain conditions. You can add behaviors to your AP divs with JavaScript. JavaScript is a program that is used to add interactivity to web pages. It is a client-side script in which, as you learned in Chapter 9, the commands from the program are executed on the user's computer. This is the opposite of server-side scripts, which are executed on the web server. Behaviors are present in pieces of JavaScript code that you can attach to page elements, such as the AP div. A behavior will instruct the page element to respond in a specific way when an event occurs, such as when the mouse pointer is positioned over the element. Behaviors are attached to page elements using ActionScript, a flash scripting language developers use to add interactivity to movies, control objects, exchange data, and create complex animations. So these page elements that are absolutely positioned or assigned on a fixed position on a web page is the most common AP div. They're created with AP div tags, and in this chapter we're going to use the term AP element when speaking in general about the AP div. You can stack AP divs on top of each other and specify that only certain elements be visible at certain times or under certain conditions. You can use these AP divs to create special effects on a web page. For instance, you can use AP divs to build a whole image from individual pieces and then add that code that slides the pieces into their position one at a time. You can also use AP divs to create dynamic pages that contain moving parts or objects that become visible or invisible based on selections made by website users using JavaScript. 
Using AP divs to lay out a web page is like working with a stack of transparent sheets that you can stack on top of each other. To insert the AP div, you can use the Draw AP Div button in the Layout category on the Insert panel and draw to draw a rectangular shape anywhere on the page. You can also insert an AP div using the Layout Objects AP Div command on the Insert menu. You're going to specify the exact dimensions, color, and other attributes such as behaviors by changing the settings in the Preference dialog box for all AP divs. As you work with these, it's often helpful to use the guides to help you place and align the divs in a consistent location. And again, a guide is just that horizontal or vertical line that's used to position page content. You can add as many guides as you need to your web page and they won't appear in the browser. To draw an AP div, I'm going to open the Striped Umbrella website and then open the index page. Then I'm going to go to View on my top ribbon menu bar and point down to Rulers and click Show. You will see that the rulers now appear along the top and left side of the page and will help me when I'm guiding the placement of my page elements. You can also see that I've clicked to be in design view here so that the whole document window is in the page and I don't have to split between the code view and the design view when placing these AP elements. I'm going to place my mouse over the horizontal ruler and click. You'll see that when I hold down my mouse button, I get the little double arrow symbols showing that I'm having a guide and I'm gonna drag this guide down and place it at about 470 pixels on my page. You can see that when I let go of my mouse button, that guide as this green line stays where I positioned it. Now I want to go to the layout category on my insert panel. So I'm going to change from forms to layout and I'm going to put draw AP div. Now when I click that button, I'm going to get a little crosshatch as my mouse pointer. I'm going to use this as a guide and draw a rectangle in the middle of my page. I want it to be approximately 250 pixels wide by 150 pixels tall. It's okay if you don't get it absolutely perfect when you first draw it because once we draw our AP div, we're going to be able to select that and then change these properties in our property inspector. So if I want it to be exactly 250 by 150, I can change my width here to 250 and my height to 150. And now my AP div is drawn exactly to those dimensions. Now I want to define my AP div, so I'm going to make sure that the AP div 1 tag is selected. And now I'm going to type the word girls down here. I want my overflow to be set to auto. And then my length, width, height, and tall are going to be set to about 749 here I also want to click on my viz drop down here and change my visible to visible Now I'm going to scroll down to the new role that has been defined in the CSS style panel called hashtag girls. And it's right here. You may see two different style sheets listed, one for the AP div role and one for any other embedded roles. To use AP divs, you must understand absolute positioning. The term absolute in this context means that the AP div will be locked in a fixed position on the page regardless of the size of the browser window. 
You position AP div absolutely by specifying the distance between the upper left corner of the AP div and the upper left corner of the page or the parent division in which it is contained. Also, the AP div will keep a position relative to the top left corner of a page as the page is scrolled. AP divs have no impact on the location of other AP divs. Or in other words, if you insert an AP div, the page elements that follow it within the code will continue with the flow of the page, ignoring the presence of the AP div. This means that you can create overlapping AP divs to create dynamic effects on a web page. To do this, you're going to use JavaScript or CGI script to change the attributes associated with each AP div in response to actions by the user. For instance, an AP div could move or change size when a user clicks or moves the mouse over a link on the page or in the AP div. You can control the placement of AP divs by setting their attributes. This is going to be done in the property inspector or by editing the role in the CSS style panel. These attributes will work together to create an AP div that will hold its position on a page. The left property, or L, specifies the distance between the left edge of the AP div and the left edge of the page or the parent page element that contains it. The top property specifies the distance between the top edge of your AP div and the top edge of the page or parent element that contains it. Whereas the width, specified as W, and height properties specify the dimensions of the AP div, usually in pixels, although the AP div can be specified as a percentage of your screen dimension if you prefer. Then we're going to use what we call the Z index property in the property inspector to specify the vertical stacking order of AP divs on a page. If you think of the page itself as AP div 0, then any number higher than that will appear on top of it. For instance, if you have three AP divs with the Z index of values of 1, 2, and 3, one will appear below 2 and 2 below 3. A 3 is always going to appear above 1 and 2. You can create a dynamic website by changing the Z settings dynamically as the user is viewing the page using Dreamweaver's built-in JavaScript behaviors. The Viz properly <clears throat> Since the AP div is like a separate document within the web page, it can contain the same elements that any page would, such as background colors, images, links, tables, and text. If you want to add an image to an AP div, you're going to insert it just as you would insert one on the page using the insert panel. If you have more content than the preset image size, the AP div will expand to display the content on your page in Dreamweaver. However, when you preview the page in the browser, the amount displayed will depend on how you set your overflow settings. As on a web page, if you specify both a background color and a background image, the background image will override the background color. As the page is loading, the AP div background color may appear until the image finishes loading. Also, with formatting text on a web page, you should use CSS to format your text on the AP div. You can also add other AP div properties such as text indent, padding, margins, or background color with styles. So to add an image to an AP div, we're going to click inside of the white IBIS AP div to place an insertion point there. Here you can see that we've selected the AP div and put a picture of an IBIS in there. Also see that the property inspector shows the AP div properties. Here we have the visible property set, and so then it's going to show this IBIS on the page in the selected AP div. You can also use the AP elements panel to control the visibility, name, and Z index order of all your AP elements on a web page. You can also use the AP Elements panel to see how an AP element is nested within the page structure and to change the nesting status of an AP element. Nested AP elements are those whose HTML code is included with another AP elements code. Nested AP elements can share common styles with the child AP element, inheriting the styles from the parent AP. 
To change the nesting status of an element, drag it to a new location in the AP Elements panel. You can open up the AP Elements panel using the Window menu or click its tab and in the CSS Styles tab group. The AP Elements panel is handy when you're trying to select an AP element on the bottom of a stack. Clicking the AP element name selects the AP element on the page and you can access the same information that is available in the AP Elements panel by selecting the AP element and viewing its settings in the Property Inspector. Using the AP Elements panel is the easiest way to change a series of AP element names, control the AP element visibility while testing a site, and to control the visible stacking order. The AP Elements panel also keeps track of all the AP elements on a page, making it easy to review the settings for each. When you insert an AP div on a page, its position is relative to the top left corner of the browser window, and a problem arises when the page is viewed in different browser window sizes. You can see that this is an example of the AP element names and then the divs used to place the page content. You can also see that the z-index values are shown here. So when you're comparing what happens when the default settings are used and a page is viewed in a wide and narrow browser window, you can see that it will keep track of all the AP elements, making it easy for you to review and then change the settings for each one of these. When you insert it, and since the position is relative, you may have a problem when the window is resized to a narrower width since the left values for the AP divs are relative to the top left corner of the browser window. So to prevent this shifting, you can make the AP divs position relative to the parent container, such as a CSS div tag. By doing this, rather than making it relative to the page in the browser, you can do the two-step process by setting the positioning property of the div tag you wish to use as the parent container to relative, and then cut and paste the code for the AP divs after the beginning tag for the parent container. The AP divs are then placed on the page relative to the top corner of the parent container and will remain in a fixed position no matter how wide or narrow the browser window gets. So first we want to set that positioning property to use the parent container as relative. Then cut and paste your code after the beginning tag of the parent container. Then place it in the page where it's going to stay into a fixed position. Next we're going to add a little bit of media and interactivity to our website. The benefit of this is because a website with text and static images is adequate for presenting information, but you can create a much richer user experience by adding movement and interactive elements to the site. You can use Dreamweaver to add media objects created in other programs to the pages of your website, and some of the external media file types include Adobe Fireworks, rollover images, buttons, video, sound, animation, flash paper, director and shockwave movies, and presentations. A plugin can also be called an add-on, and this is a small computer program that works with a host application such as a web browser to allow it to perform certain functions. Flash is a software program that allows you to create a low bandwidth, high quality animation and interactive element that you can place on your web pages. Low bandwidth animations are ones that require a, don't require a fast connection to work properly. These animations use a series of vector-based graphics that will load quickly and merge with other graphics and sounds to create short movies. Vector-based graphics are scalable graphics that are built using mathematical formulas rather than pixels. This shows an example of a website based on Flash. Once you create these short movies, you can place them on your web page, and then the Flash movies will require Flash Player, a plugin that's included in the latest versions of most browsers. If you're using an older browser that doesn't support the version of Flash created in your movie, you can download the latest Flash Player from the Adobe website for free. Almost all desktop internet browsers worldwide use a flash player, however the mobile and touch screen markets are not as supportive. So even though you have the benefit of that low bandwidth animation, you may not be able to get to the tablet and mobile communities. As HTML5 gains support across all browsers, you will want to start using those tags to insert and format your media content. 
So when you insert a Flash Swift file named crabdance.swf in this chapter, it will work fine in all browsers that support the Flash plugin. But for those that don't, you're going to want to use the HTML5 media tags to insert the file. The Flash movies inserted with the menu or insert panel will work correctly, but they will not pass the HTML5 validation. When you use the insert panel to add Flash content to a web page, the code that links and runs the content, such as detecting the presence of a Flash player on the computer and directing the user to download the player if it's not found, is embedded into the page code. The original Flash file will be stored as a separate file on the website root folder. There are several types of Flash content that you can incorporate to enhance your user's experience as they view and interact with your website. A flash button is a button made from a small movie that you can insert on a web page to provide navigation, either in place of or in addition to other types of hyperlinks, such as plain text links. You can assign flash buttons a variety of behaviors in response to user actions, such as opening a different page in the browser when the mouse pointer is placed over it. Flash buttons have the .swf file extension, and using, using Flash, you can also create Flash movies that include multimedia elements, such as audio files, both music and voiceovers. Animated objects, scripted objects, clickable links, and just about any other animated or clickable object imaginable can be made with Flash. You can use Flash movies to add content to your existing website or to create an entire website. To add a Flash movie to a web page, you're going to click on SWF from the Media menu in the common category on the Insert panel. To open the Select Swift dialog box and then choose the Flash movie you want to insert. As with images, you always want to add a title tag when inserting Flash content to provide accessibility. You also need to include the code that will instruct the browser to check for and load Flash Player so that the user can view the Flash content on the page. Live view or preview them in a browser window, and it's also good to turn off the loop option unless you want the content to play continuously while the page is being viewed. To add a rollover image, it's going to swap these images basically using a behavior. It's going to change the appearance when the mouse pointer either is placed over it or scrolls on top of it. It's actually two images, and the first one is the one that appears when the pointer is not positioned over it, and the second is the one that will appear when the mouse pointer is over it. Rollover images are often used to help create a feeling of action and excitement on a web page. For instance, suppose you're creating a website that promotes a series of dance classes. You could create a rollover image using two images of a dancer in two different poses, and when the user places the mouse pointer over the image of the dancer in the first pose, the image would change to show the dancer in a different pose, creating a feeling of movement. You can also add a link to a rollover image so that the image will change only when the link is clicked. You can add rollover images to a web page using the rollover image command on the images menu in both the common category shown in figure 8 and the original image in the insert rollover image dialog box. Dreamweaver automatically adds two behaviors to these images, a swap image behavior and a swap image restore behavior. The swap image behavior is a JavaScript code that directs the browser to display a different image when the mouse is rolled over it, whereas a swap image restore behavior will restore the swapped image back to the original file once the mouse leaves the area. You can make your web pages come alive by adding interactive elements to them. For instance, if you're creating a page about animals, you could attach an action to each picture that would result in a pop-up message with the description of the animal when the user rolls the mouse over it. You can also add actions like this to elements by attaching behaviors to them. Behaviors are set of instructions that you can attach to page elements that tell the page element to respond in a specific way when an event occurs such as when the mouse pointer is positioned over it. When you attach a behavior to an element, Dreamweaver will generate the JavaScript code for the behavior and inserts it into your page code. 
You can use the Behaviors panel located in the Tag Inspector panel group to insert a variety of JavaScript-based behaviors on a page. For instance, using the Behaviors panel, you can automate tasks, have items respond to user selections and mouse movements with pop-up menus, create games, or go to a different web address. You can also add dynamic effects to your web page. To insert a behavior, click the Add Behavior button on the Behavior panel to open the Action menu, and then select a behavior from the menu. Actions are triggered by events. For instance, if you want the user to see a page element slide across the page when the element is clicked, you would attach the slide action using the onClick event to trigger this action. Other examples of events are on mouse over and on load. The on mouse over event will trigger an action when the mouse is placed over an object. The on load event will trigger an action when the page is first loaded in the browser window. Some of the behaviors that you can add to web pages use a JavaScript library called the Spry Framework for AJAX, or Asynchronous JavaScript and XML. AJAX is a method for developing interactive web pages that respond quickly to user input, such as clicking a map. In the library, you will find Spry widgets, which are pre-built components for adding interactivity to your pages, and Spry effects, which are screen effects that will basically fade or enlarge in a page element. When you add a Spry effect to a page element, Dreamweaver will automatically add Spry assets folder to your site root folder, and it'll have all the supporting files inside of this folder. When you add media-rich content to your web pages, such as video, you're going to want to use several different formats. One of the most popular is the MP4 format. You can insert a video in Dreamweaver with the Insert Media plugin command, but HTML5 introduced another way to add video to the video tag. The advantages of this num method are numerous. It supports video in native formats and is compatible with all browsers. You can also access the video controls using a keyboard, and you can include the code to link to multiple video formats to provide access for all browsers and make your video searchable by search engines. To add a video with the video tag, you add the tags in the code view, and other video formats that you can link to or embed on a web page are AVI, which is Audio Visual Interleave, and Microsoft Standard for Digital Video, FLV, is Adobe Flash Video, and WebM is an open royalty-free media format sponsored by Google. MOV is an Apple QuickTime Movie, and OGG is a free open container format developed by the Zeif Org Foundation. Currently, MP4, WebM, and OGG formats support the HTML5 video tag, However, not all browsers support all three formats, so it's a good idea to provide multiple file formats for your users to make sure that they're going to be able to play the video. Users access the playback controls with a controller. A controller appears as a graphic element called a skin placed over or below the video. They can include buttons or sliders to stop, start, and pause the video, control the sound level or mute the sound, or display a script of the video. After a user clicks the play button, the file begins downloading and starts to play as it downloads. A progressive video download will download the video to the user's computer and then allow the video to play before it's completely downloaded. It will finish the download as the video plays, but the user will not notice that this is taking place. Whereas a streaming video download is similar to a progressive download, it uses a buffer to gather the content as it downloads and ensure smoother playback. A buffer is a temporary storage area on your hard drive that acts as a holding area for the video content as it's being played. Controllers can be coded to customize both the appearance of the skin and the controls that will be included. Used sparingly, video can be a really effective way to add interest and depth to your web pages. So I've gone out and grabbed the Chapter 11 assets and put this anchor video from the drive and folder where I store my data files into the Striped Umbrella website root folder. Now I've also opened up our About Us 
HTML page, and I want to place the insertion point at the bottom of my text here. So I'm just going to click there at the bottom and hit enter. Now I'm going to click on the media list arrow. So I'm going to go to the common category first on my insert panel, and then I need to scroll down to find the media. Now you'll see that I also have another little drop down menu here. So I'm going to click on that to open up that list panel and I'm going to go down to plugin. This will give me a little browser window where I want to browse to my local site route and then I want to go down and grab the umbrella anchor video. You'll see that a placeholder for my video shows up here and you can only view the video when it, the browser is in live view. So with the plugin placeholder selected, I'm going to change my width value to 220, and I'm going to change my height to 200 pixels. In the parameters button, I want to make sure that it goes to auto start. So I'm going to click on this. That's not working how I wanted. There are several ways to incorporate sound into a website. Sound files are relatively small in file size and easy to add to a page. You can embed them as background sounds, embed them on a page with visible sound controls, link them to a page, or add them to a page with the new audio tags introduced with HTML5. A few audio file formats don't require a plugin to play, such as the WAV and AIF file formats, but files that do require a plugin are MP3 or MPEG. These can be played using QuickTime, Windows Media Player, or Real Player plugins. Before you decide to add sound to a web page, you want to think about the purpose you have in mind. Will the sound add to the rich media experience for your users? What devices will your users use to play the sound? Have you tested the audio file to make sure that the quality is excellent? And if you decide to use the audio tag in HTML5, provide more than one file format as all audio formats are not supported by all browsers. File formats that are supported with the HTML5 audio tag are the MP3, the WAV, and the OGD. The code to add in an audio file with HTML5 is audio and then you put the source as well as a disclaimer saying your device does not support the audio element. The controller that appears on your page is determined by the text to add the sound file. Dreamweaver has a generic controller that you'll see when you add a sound file in the following steps. The controller used with HTML5 looks a little bit different and you can use the CSS3 to change the appearance of the controller but all controllers will have a basic play and pause button as a way to, and a way to control the volume. If you look at figure 24 on page 11-23, you will see that the Federal Aviation Administration website provides audio recordings made in control towers. When you click the link to play the recording, a new window will open up with a controller that you use to play, pause, and adjust the volume. So when we want to add sound to our website, we're going to go to Dreamweaver, and here we're going to insert the file interviews.mp3. I want to do this on my activities page, so I'm going to go ahead and close about us and open up activities. Then at the bottom of this page, I want to type in the text. Here are some comments from our recent guests. Then I'm going to insert a paragraph break by hitting enter, and then I'm going to go to my media and click the drop down. And here I'm going to select plugin. Then I'm going to find the interviews.mp3. Click OK. And now plugin icon placeholder will appear on my page. I'm going to select it and that will pull up the properties in my property inspector here. I want to set my values to 200. The height I want to set to 60. 
And then I also want to add a parameter of auto start faults. Now when I view this page in a browser, I will see the control panel, which will allow me to play and pause while the video is playing. When you create a website, it's important to make sure that each page has a unified look so that users know that they are in your site no matter what page they're viewing. For instance, you should make sure that a common element such as a menu bar and company banner appear in the same place on every page and that every page shares basic design and color schemes. You have been using styles to provide continuity in your sites. And another way to make sure that every page in your site has a consistent appearance is by creating pages based on templates. A template is a special kind of page that contains both locked regions, which are areas on the page that cannot be modified by others who add content, such as content contributors, as well as other types of regions that they can change or edit. For instance, an optional region is an area in the template that content contributors can choose to show or hide. And an editable region is an area where the template content contributors can add or change content. Using template not only ensures a consistent appearance throughout your website, but it also saves considerable development time. Templates are especially helpful if you're working with a team to create pages in your site. The ideal process for using templates is one person, the template author, will create the template with locked regions containing the design elements that will be common to every page. Then the regions that are editable content contributors will add or change to. Once the template is fully developed, other team members can use it to create other site pages, adding the appropriate content to the editable regions of each page. If the template author makes changes to the template, then all the pages to which the template is attached can automatically be updated to reflect those changes. If you've already created and designed a page that you think looks great, you want to use this layout and design for other pages in your site, you can save this page as a template using the Save as Template command. These are all saved with the .dwt extension. And by default, all the content on this page will be locked. So when you do this, you need to make sure that your site doesn't have a templates folder. And then when you list the templates in your site, you want to preview it to open. So by default, when you save a template, all the content on the page is locked, which means that no one else can add or modify any part of the template to create new pages. So if the template is going to be used effectively, we have to define at least one region for editing. That's so the other content contributors can add content. We can specify a name for the region using the new editable region dialog box. Editable regions are outlined in blue on the template page and the name of the regions appear in blue shaded boxes. In addition to the editable regions, we can also add optional regions to a template. This is an option that allows us to set an area for content contributors to either show or hide. For instance, you can place an image in an opt optional region so that the content contributors can decide whether or not to show it on the page that they are creating. An optional region's visibility is controlled by the conditional statement IF. You can specify a page element as optional using the new optional region dialog box this region and specify whether to show or hide it by default. You access the editable and optional regional dialog boxes by clicking the templates list arrow in the common category of the insert panel. If you want to give contributors the ability to show or hide elements as well as make modifications to it, then you can define the element as an editable optional region. 
For instance, if you want to make an advertisement an editable optional region so that content contributors of the template can change its text and specify whether to show or hide it, you can put the new optional region dialog box and name the region and specify whether to show or hide it by default. So here we have the template to create a striped umbrella web page. You can see that the notation up here is showing that this is based on the activities page template. And you can also see that if I go over a locked region that's not defined by that blue area, that it won't allow people to edit it. And then they'll get the little locked region icon. So when you create a new page that's based on it, there are going to be those certain areas that are locked. And another way to allow content contributors to modify it is through what we call in-context editing, or ICE. This is an online service that users can use to log in and be allowed to make changes to a designated editable region on a page while viewing it in the browser. This requires little knowledge of HTML or Dreamweaver, and the commands to create the regions are found in the in-context editing category on the insert panel. There are many advantages to using this for creating a web page. You can also create a new page based on a template by right clicking on the template in the assets panel and then clicking new from template. When you create a new page that's based on a template, those certain areas of the page will be locked and you can tell which ones are locked by the appearance of that mouse pointer. When you're positioned over a locked region, the mouse pointer will appear in the shape of a circle with a line cutting through it, and editable regions will be outlined in blue and marked with a shaded blue label. Editing, deleting, or adding content in editable regions of a template page works just like it does on any other page. Simply select the element you want to modify, make your changes, and then click in the editable region and insert the new comment. You want to make sure that your adding when you add links to your pages that's based on a template that it's important to use relative when you add links to pages that are based on a template it's really important to use the document relative link otherwise they will not work the best and easiest way of doing this is by using the point to file icon to specify the document relative to the link The path to the link will actually go from the template file, not from the template-based page, to the linked page. So to ensure that all links are document relative, select the page element to which you want to add a link, and then drag the point to file icon from the property inspector to the page in the files panel. Sometimes you need to apply a template to a page you've already created. If so, then before you attach a template to an existing page, delete any elements from the page that also appear in the template. Then, you open the page you want to detach, modify it on the menu bar, point to templates, and then click Detach from Template. This is an example of the phishing page based on a template. As you can see, we have the blue tab showing that the only editable region on this page is in the main content area. The powerful reason for using templates is because it can save a lot of time. Websites should always be updated frequently to keep the content fresh and timely. And if your site is based on a template or a group of templates, you will have a much easier time making those changes. You can use the same skills to make changes to a template as you would when creating the template. You start by opening the template from the Files panel or Asset panel, and then adding, deleting, or editing the content as you would on any non-template-based page. One of the greatest benefits of working with templates is that any change you make to the template will be automatically nested to anything else of the pages that are based on this template. For example, the files that are based on the Activities page template are golfing, fishing, and cruises. By just simply clicking the Update button, a nested template will go out to all of the different pages that are based on this and update them appropriately. So any change that you make to the template will be made automatically to all the other nested templates, which is just that template that's based on an existing one called the root template.
Then when you save a template that you've modified, the update template file dialog box opens asking you if you want to update all the files on your site which are based on that template. When you click update, the update pages dialog box will open and provide a summary of all the files that were updated. Now this is used by a lot of people, so it's a good idea to include several optional regions in it so that template users can pick and choose from a wide range of content elements. This will help keep your pages interesting and fresh. You might also want to set parameters for your optional regions, specifying that they're displayed or hidden based on conditions. And nested templates can be helpful here when you want to define a page or parts of it in greater detail. If you're working on a complex website that has lots of different pages or things that are used by lots of different people, you might need to create nested templates so that they can be based on another template. However, that root template is always going to be made as far as changes to the entire site, and the nested templates will be based on the grouping that you've assigned to them. So any original template can automatically be updated and the editable regions in the original template will be passed on as editable regions to the nested template. However, if you add a new editable or optional region that was passed on from the original, then that won't work in the nested template. There could be times when you want users of your template to be able to change certain attributes of an element that's in a locked region, and you can use the editable tag attributes to change this. So here's the editable tag attribute dialog box, and you can see which attributes that you want to edit here. When you define the editable attributes in locked regions, the template users will make changes to the elements attributes using the template properties dialog box. Next, we're going to talk about working with the library items and snippets, because when you're creating a website, chances are good that you'll want certain graphics or text blocks to appear in more than one place on the site. For instance, you might want the company contact information in several different places, or a footer containing links to the main pages of the site at the bottom of every page. Library items and snippets can help you work with these repeating elements more effectively. If you want an element to appear repeatedly, then it's a good idea to save it as a library item. A library item is content that can contain text or graphics that you plan to use multiple times in your website and that is saved in a separate file in the library file of your website. When you need to use a library item on a web page, you can easily select it from the list of available library items in the library catalog in the Assets panel. In addition to be ready, being readily available, the other advantage of using library items is when you make a change to the library item and then update it, all the instances of that item throughout your entire website will be updated to reflect that change. Here's the assets panel showing the preview of the library item, what library item is selected, and the assets panel showing the contact underscore info library item. You can't edit library items on an open web page, so to make changes to it, you have to open it and then make sure that the item is in the document window where you can make edits or add content to it. So here we see a preview of the library button and then the logo and contact info. The preview of the logo is up above and then the library items are shown in the assets panel. By using these library items for repetitive elements, especially those that need to be updated frequently, we can save considerable time. For instance, suppose you want to feature an employee of the month photograph on every page in your website. You could create a library item named employee photo and add it to every page. Then when you need to update the photo to the site to show a new employee photo, simply replace the photo contained in the library item and the photo will be updated throughout the site. Library items can contain a wide range of content, including text, images, tables, flash files, and audio files. To view library items, you want to open the Assets panel, click the Library button, and then show the list. The preview of the library item will appear above the list, and to save a text or image as a library item, just select it in the document window and then drag it to the library on the Assets panel. You can also view a list of available library items by expanding the library folder in the Files panel. 
You can't edit those library items on an open web page, so to make changes, you want to open it. If there is a time when you want to make changes to a particular instance of the library item on one page, but you don't want that to go site-wide, then you can just modify that particular instance. You want to make sure that you go in and just change, for instance here, in Florida, as the text on this library item. Now we want that there just on this one page so we edit that instance of it rather than modifying the library item so that it doesn't go site-wide. Since we can't edit the library items on an open page, any changes we want to make has to be opened through the library by selecting the item in the document window and then clicking the open in the property inspector. The library item will then appear in the document window where we can make edits or add comments to it. And then when we're satisfied with our edits, we can save the library item using the save command on the file menu. When we do this, update library items dialog box will appear and it will ask you if you want to update all instances of this item throughout the site. You have several buttons for working with library items such as open, detach from original, and recreate. If you know that you're never going to need a library item again, you can delete it. But once you create a library item, you can add it to any page in a website, and all you have to do is drag that item from the asset panel to the desired location on the page. Then when you insert it, the actual content as a reference to a library item will be copied in the code, and the inserted library item will be shaded in yellow. This saves time and also code in your web pages, which will allow it to download faster. You can also insert library items on pages by selecting the item in the Assets panel and then clicking Insert. However, there may be times when you want to delete a library item. Keep in mind this only removes it from the library folder and it doesn't change the contents of the pages that actually have that item. So you need to recreate the library item after you've exited and started Dreamweaver again and you need to provide a deleted library item instance remaining on a page. After you recreate the library item, it will reappear on the asset panel and you can make changes to it and update any pages that are have that site. <clears throat> Keep in mind that you cannot use the undo command to restore a library item. However, you can restore a library item by selecting any instance of it on the site and clicking recreate in the property inspector. You can also recreate a library item after you have exited and started Dreamweaver again, provided a deleted library item has still an instance remaining somewhere on your website. After you recreate a library item, it will reappear on the asset panel and you can make changes to it and update all the pages in the site again. Creating a website is a huge task, so it's nice to know that you can save time by using ready-made code snippets to create various elements in your site. The Snippets panel is located in the File Panel group, and it contains a large collection of reusable code snippets organized in folders and named by element type. The Snippets panel is divided into two panes. The lower pane contains folders that can be expanded to view the snippets, and the upper pane displays a preview of the selected snippet. Use the buttons at the bottom of the snippet panel to insert a snippet, create a new folder in the snippet panel, create a new snippet, edit a snippet, or remove a snippet. Adding a snippet to a page is an easy task. Simply drag it from the snippets panel to the desired location on your page. Once you position the snippet, you will be asked to replace the placeholder text, link, and images with appropriate content. You can also add a snippet to a page by selecting the snippet in the panel and then clicking the Insert button on the Snippets panel. Once you've modified a snippet so that it contains the text and graphics appropriate for your site, you might want to save it with a new name. Doing this will save time to using the snippet on other pages. To save a modified snippet as a new snippet, just select the snippet content in the document window and then click on the New Snippet button. This will open the Snippet dialog box. Use this dialog box to name the snippet and give it a description. In 
summary, you may have trouble trying to make sense of the wealth of information that you've learned in this course. From the introduction to the conclusion, you have been challenged to learn what Dreamweaver CS6 has to offer. Now that the course is coming to a close, it is up to you to take your newfound knowledge of web design and run with it. This can be a great challenge, but the Adobe Help Viewer is always available to help you answer any questions you might have or to solve any problems you may come across. The best way to learn it is to do it. So go out there and have some fun.